Well, hi again, everybody. Uh, welcome to my latest video. In this one, I'm going to continue with the virtual box. In particular, I'm going to focus on a few more advanced features, some of the advanced settings, and how to install other operating systems, such as Linux, Ubuntu Linux, and a NAS server. I'm going to use Sigma NAS. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you get something out of it, please consider subscribing to my channel. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do with the VirtualBox is install the VirtualBox extension pack. This is the main VirtualBox download web page, as I shown in the previous video. However, this time I'm going to go here to the extension pack and I'm going to download that. As you can see here, it's the Oracle VM VirtualBox extension pack. Now it's a special program that's meant to run inside a VirtualBox. A couple of different ways to install it. One is to actually get VirtualBox up and then use one of the features there. But I think if we just double click on it, that should work. Opens up VirtualBox and it wants to know, do I want to install the extension pack? So I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. It's asking me if I agree. You have to scroll all the way down and I agree to it. And that's it, fully installed at this point. Now, what did I get by doing that? You come over here and you look at what's included in this VirtualBox extension pack. It includes several features, including the addition of USB 2.0, the ability to pass through a USB 2.0 device and a 3.0 device using the EHCI and XHCI configuration options. And it also allows for remote desktop protocol, webcam pass through, and a few other features here. So now we have VirtualBox up. As you may have noticed since the last video, uh, I included a couple of more operating systems here. Originally, all I had was the two Windows, A and B copies. I've also made some changes to the A copy, to the configuration that I like to do, so I can use it more freely. And I have other operating systems, including Ubuntu Linux Server, Ubuntu Linux Client, with the full graphical user interface. That's the main difference between these two. Although with the server, you can also make it a very stripped down version. So you're given a lot of installation choices. And then finally, I have Sigma NAS, which you've seen me install in previous videos and creating a new server. But I do want to cover some of the settings that I didn't cover last time, which are more of an intermediate level type configuration. So the first off, let's talk about cloning. So for example, I have here this A that I said that uh, I have configured to my liking. Well, I can go ahead now and make all those same configuration changes to the B, which is basically the same way I installed it in the last video. I didn't touch it since then. Or a simpler way of doing it, if I click on it here and then I go to machine, drop down off the top menu, there's an option called clone. And if I go ahead and clone, what do I want to call this one? Well, I'm gonna call it C. So it's gonna be image C which will be a complete copy of image A. I mean, it copies the whole virtual disk and all the configuration exactly as it is right now, configured as A, it'll become now a full copy into C. There are a couple of changes you should make afterwards, and I'll show you those. It's going to the same directory I have set as my default directory for my images. I want a full clone rather than making a linked clone. A linked clone would be just another entry here in virtual bot for that same image with two different ways to get to it. Now, there are some advanced reasons why you want to do that, but most people won't find the need for doing something like that. I can also have a copy snapshot. Right now it's only set for the current machine state. Snapshots is an advanced feature also that I'm not gonna go into any real detail here, but it allows you to take sort of, as it says, a snapshot of how it was at a particular instance, but it doesn't store the whole image again. It stores only part of it. Everything else looks the same. And then all I have to do at this point is type clone. It only takes about a minute, minute and a half. This is a small image, so it shouldn't be any big deal. And here we go. Now we have a Win 10-64C. So I'm in as administrator. Let me go to a command prompt first of all and type in ipconfig. You may not have remembered from the previous video, but now I've got a completely new IP address. As a matter of fact, I could prove that by running the other image and you will see that it has the other IP address that we last received. So that's one of the things, but I really want to come into here and look at this PC and I want to look at properties. And the thing that I want to change here is it still thinks it's win A. So it still thinks it's image A. I don't want that. I'm going to change that. I'm going to call it win C. 
so that I can identify them easily later on when I'm running other utilities. I'm going to apply that and then I'm going to go into here, change the actual computer name to that as well. Everything else is the same. I'm not yet part of a domain and I got to restart the image. Restart now. Well, we should be good. Let me see what it comes up as now. Now I'm win C. I'll have an A, B, and a C. C is a complete copy of A. Now there's a lot of power behind this because not only do I have more than one, but now I can actually decide to play with this one. If there's some piece of software I want to install, or if there is some configuration change I'm not 100% sure about, what I can do is I make a clone of it. I make the change to that one, and then I will actually see if it hurts anything or not. It's very easy to delete any of the images. Let me shut this one down. And if I wanted to delete it, did a right click on it, and now I can remove it. And it will disappear completely. For now, I'll leave it. It does it immediately. It, it does prompt you a little box where it says delete all files or just remove the name from this table. Generally, you want to get the whole thing removed, which includes all files associated with it. So be careful about that if you decided to share files between images. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was some of the configuration setup changes. So you pick an image and I want to talk about the clipboard. So if you go into any image and you pick settings, general settings, advanced, and one thing here is called shared clip clipboard. Now I already changed this one on this image. It's set for yes, bi-directional. By default, it's disabled. So if I have a shared clipboard, what that'll allow me to do is actually in my host environment over here on the side, you know, I could have any application running. There's something in there I want to copy and paste into one of the images. By doing this, it'll allow me to do that function properly. I just have to copy and then paste it in. Now on the processor, this is where you would add more processors to it. Right now, this one is set for three. I believe that's the number that I picked when we first installed it. I can set it to more or less. You can also, which I highly discourage, you can reduce the system's capability. In this case, this image running as a computer system. How capable is it? How much of the resources will it try to use? It's obviously a shared system, so it will use as much as the shared kernel allows it to use, but you could give it a priority or you could reduce its priority. It's an advanced feature. I would just leave it alone for now, unless you really have something where you're running like 50 of these images simultaneously, you may want to reduce the capability of some of them. Storage is an important one because what you see here is what's currently attached as far as storage to this image. It has things like whether or not you're using SATA or something else. But this shows you have a SATA controller which can have up to 30 SATA devices on it and what it currently has. It has the virtual hard drive image that's associated with this virtual machine. It also has connected to it what it thinks is a optical drives, which has on it the Windows 10 distribution that it used to install it. Let's look at the network. Right now I have it set for bridged adapter. I mentioned that in the first video. It is the most flexible of them all. I'll put up on the screen here a copy of the modes. This shows all the main modes that you would ever really want to use. And Bridged is the most flexible. It can do everything we want it to do. It can allow network connections between virtual machines and the host in both directions. It can allow connections between virtual machine and virtual machine. And it could connect virtual machine to the world or to a local area network that you're connected to along the way. It has all plus signs in it, which means it covers all those options. The other ones are reduced capability. There is a disadvantages to bridged, which some people may run into if they're using VirtualBox in a production environment. It's not as secure. There's a trade-off. Good security means less connectivity. And then finally, the last one I want to talk about is the USB. You have this option for setting up pass-through for your USB devices from your host computer. Since I installed the extended box, I have the option of doing many different types of controllers, including a controller that supports USB 3.0. Before I did that extended pack install, the only thing that showed here was USB 1.1. So that's another reason to put the extended pack on there. But you create these things called filters. You come in here and say add filter, looking at the list of available USBs, it will show you all of the different USB devices that you can add that are available on the host computer right now. So if I want to add one of these, 
and I have a USB device attached to this host, I would click on this one, add new USB filter. It gives a list of all the USBs that it sees, and the one that I want to connect to would be the universal disk. And by creating that, now that particular device will pass through. And if you click on it, you'll see the way it's configured right now. You can filter it on different manufacturer types, names of the stick, and so forth. And then only those would pass through. And those are the configuration settings that I wanted to cover in this video that I didn't cover before. Now let's go ahead and install another image. Now I already have Ubuntu installed, but as I said before, you can install as many as you want. So I'm going to come to the main choice here, and I'm going to say new. And what I want to call here is I'm going to say Ubuntu server. Now I already have a server 64A, so I'm going to make this 64B. And just by what I typed here, as we showed in the last video, it identified the version that I want. And it sets up some preliminary configurations by doing that. Now I go to next. How much memory do I want to start it out with? I won't give it that much. I'll give it just two gigabytes. Go to next. I want to create a virtual hard disk. Now, I mentioned this in the last one, but I didn't give a lot of detail. The difference between a virtual hard disk and uh, image is the hard disk comes up with a fixed size image to start with. So it will start off with 10 gigabyte size. That'll be eating up space on my drive C on this host computer, to be honest with you. But it will then load much quicker. If you do it the other way, it comes very small and then it grows as needed. So it'll be very slow initially. Then I'll say next to that. I do want it to be dynamically allocated, which means what I specified there is a size is only a starting size. It's set for 10 gig of the hard disk. I'll leave it at that. That sounds perfectly reasonable to start off with. Ubuntu is actually much smaller than Windows. And it's putting it in the right place. It'll be called Ubuntu 64B. I already have a 64A, so this is becoming 6. So it picks the same name I type, and it's going to name the file after that. And I'll say create. Now what do I have here? An Ubuntu 64B. What I then have to do, as I did last time, is I have to run it. I can just double click on it, which will run it. And now i got to tell it where to get the installation image from. What well, would normally go on to optical drive, drive D in this case. But I'm going to change that. I happen to have Ubuntu desktop, which is also the another name for the client version of Ubuntu with the full graphical user interface. So I'm going to choose that one. That looks correct. I'm going to start it. I do want to change the view so that I have a scaled mode. That way I can make the view bigger for me. Install, bring it up, trying to boot from that image. And I want to install Ubuntu. It looks like English English is good for who I am. Right? I don't want to have updates downloaded at this point. I'll do those later on. That'll really slow down the process of installing it. So I just want a normal installation. It's going to erase the whole disk, which is that image file, that 10 gig image file. Fine, install it. Mostly taking the defaults. Continue. Time zone looks right. Actually better than Windows and identifying my time zone, which is good. I'll go ahead and jump ahead at this point. Okay, it's all installed and now it's rebooting. Let's see what we got. And there we go. That's my full name, even though the actual account name is my normal admin account, as you'll see later. Give it the regular password for the admin account. And here we are. We're in the desktop of the actual client version of Ubuntu Linux. Let me take a look at, um, do a command line prompt. I have to go into utilities first, and then in utilities, I have to type in terminal. Click on terminal. So here we are. As you can see, I am David under admin, Ubuntu client B. For Linux, I've got to do an interface config, IF config. And as we can see, it picked up an IP address. INET is 172.16.1.143. So the network is configured properly. That's the interface name. It always has this thing called a loopback. You always see that when you actually look at the details of the configuration file for any Unix system. But that looks good. Don't want to get into too much of this. In a future video, I'll talk about Linux in a lot more detail. I just wanted to show that I could bring it right up. And I could come over here and I could shut it down. Power off. So it's going to power off the image running. And there we are. I now have two copies of the client the A that I originally had installed, and then I had this one here. Now let me install uh, Sigma NAS. So I'm gonna create another one yet. Let me do a new, in this case, I'm going to call it, uh, use the same name that I used before with a B on it. So it'll be Sigma 
NAS B. It is not Linux, it doesn't identify what Sigma NAS is, so I gotta define it. So I'm gonna go ahead and define it as BSD. That's what Sigma NAS is based upon, free BSD. Hold it to 32 bit, I wanna change it to 64 bit. Next, I'm gonna start this guy out with two as well, two gigabytes of memory. It doesn't use that much memory, so it never will even use that much. I'll start it out that way. Next, I do wanna create a hard disk image. 16 gig is more than enough. Create, I wanna create again a hard disk. I want it to be fixed at that size. Particularly important when dealing with creating an image for a network accessible storage or NAS. I want it to be fixed size. I don't want this one to dynamically allocate. 16 gig is more than enough. And I'll do, it's set for B already. It's in the right, going to the right place. So we're good to go. I can say create. There we go. Now I gotta make sure I have these settings right. This is important for this one, the network itself. So I gotta go into the network and tell it again, bridged adapter. Okay, so at this point, I guess I'm ready to install Sigma NAS. Currently has storage of an IDE controller. So what I will do before I install, I will go ahead and add a SATA controller to that. I will, I'll leave the existing image that we created on the IDE, not a problem, but I'll add a new storage SATA controller and I'll leave it at that. There's no drives on it though, just the controller exists. Now if I double click on this, it prompt me for where to boot from. And right now it thinks it's going to the optical drive, so I'm gonna change that to using the Sigma NAS image. So the Sigma NAS 64-bit image, the live CD, that's good, and I'm gonna start it. Let me change the view so it is a uh, scaled mode, and I get to grow it a little bit for everybody to see. So we're booting from that image, which is what it thinks is a CD or a USB drive if I was using an, a USB boot device. So this is Sigma NAS booting up. It'll be running in memory only once it's completely loaded. Okay, so now it's up and running. It defaulted to an IP address that's assigned in the Sigma NAS image. I'm gonna wanna change that, but I don't have to change that now. After I install, I can change that. So the first thing I need to do is now do a full install. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit, but I'll go through all the steps. Okay, Sigma NAS is successfully installed. So I will shut this down. I'm gonna to have to go into the settings and I'm going into the system processor. I'm gonna turn off the floppy and turn off the optical. I'm gonna just for the heck of it, move this up to the top entry. I'm gonna do okay. So now hopefully when I boot it, it's booting from just the new hard disk image that I created. So we got here, if I boot this, it looks like it is working just the way I recognize it. And it's booting off of the image, not off of the, the installation media. So now I get a login. Using the defaults that Sigma NAS provides. Now I gotta configure the interface. So the first thing I do is number one, configure the network interface. EM0 is the one that I want, that's the up one. I'll take that. Do I want to proceed? Yes. Now I want to set the IP address and all the other options to it, which is configure the network IP address to. Okay, it's all configured. Now just for the heck of it, I'm going to reboot it and make sure that I'm running the same one. So we're good. It has the IP address I set. We're running off the image at this point. It's just a verification that I did. Now I'll push this aside actually, because I wanna show you how we get to it. Let me open up one of the Windows images. Let's see if this sees the new server, which I, by the way, you may have noticed I put it at uh, the address of 211 in my little network here. Okay, let me see if I can ping it. <laughs> There we go, a reply from it. Now I picked 211 because I have the other image set for 210. 
So at this point I should be able to connect right to the Sigma NAS server. I'll open up a window here. I'll type in the address 211. There we go. There we go. We're in Sigma NAS. So if I log in here, the default, I am now running in the latest version of Sigma NAS. And what I can show you here too, just for the heck of it, just to show you, I have my other server up being staged. So if I open up another one, another window here, Let me see if I can connect the both of them at the same time and I should be able to just to show you that they're unique. That's my other server. This has a different password. Now this is the older version running. As you recall, I had the older version installed on my other server. So this is 12.0.0.4. This one here is 12.1.0.4. And this one here has a bunch of storage associated, it has six cores to it. <laughs> How many cores does this one have? I believe I just gave it the one core. What I don't have is disk drives attached. So that's the last thing I'll show you on this. Let me shut these both down. So as you can see, even from an image of Windows, I was able to get to my other server, which is on the same network. They're both using fixed addresses. So let me see this one here. I'm going to actually do a shutdown. And we should see the window in the back shut down. There we go, shutting down. And if we look at what's going on with uh, Sigma NAS, it now shows that it's powered off. B is powered off. Now let's put some drives on that image. I gotta go to the storage. I have a SATA controller already on there, but I wanna be able to add to it a drive. So I wanna add a hard disk. That's a, this little icon here with the plus sign. I'm gonna add a hard drive. Now, I've already got all of these other ones. Notice my other Sigma NAS image has four 40 gig hard drives to it. I'm gonna make three 20 gig ones for this one just to be different. So I'm gonna create, I don't want a dynamic, I want a fixed drive. I don't want, I want this one virtual hard disk. And I want this guy to be, let's say, I'll make it 30, 30 gig just to be safe. And it'll be in the same location. It'll be called Sigma NAS B, which is this server, number one. And I'll do a create. Now I can save some time here by just replicating that one. So I have this one here now that's set. As you can see, it's not attached to an image. It's just a floating hard drive there, 30 gig. I don't know if I can do it from here, now I have to get out of this. I am going to go to the file, uh, virtual media manager, and I should now see all of the things that I have. And here's this new virtual hard disk. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy it and I wanna make another virtual hard disk. And I'm gonna call this one not dot copy, but I'm going to call it two. And then I'll make a number three. I'll copy that one. Virtual hard disk. I'll make this one number three. I'm going to copy it. I'll have three of these, as you can see, three 30 gig ones that will be available for me to attach to that image. So I have all three now set up. Let me go back to storage on this thing, on this image. I want to attach, I want to add hard drives to it. So it automatically opens up what's available to me. I don't have to create, I'm going to do an add. So I'll add the first one. I'm going to choose that and add it. So now I've added in this dash under one. I'm going to add another one. I'm going to add number two now. I'm going to add another one. I'm going to add number three now. So now I have three hard drives attached to this SATA controller. So let me say okay to that. Let me run the actual server, the B1 in this case. And all this does is bring it up by, at this point, it doesn't really matter. I, I'm not gonna manage it from within this window. So I can actually make this one quite small and just keep it out of the way once it's up and running. I put it down in there, for example. I'm just making sure it comes up cleanly. And then I need to run a Windows again. It's up and running, it's 2.11. Let me run a Windows image. At this point, I can do it from my host as well. I don't have to run an image, but just to show you how it works, because that's accessible to even my host at this point because of the bridged networking that I did. And we log into this thing, window, and go to this server, log in. There we go, and I'm at the 12.1 again. Now let's see if it sees these disks. I should have added more processors to it, but that's okay. Disk management. It doesn't see any disk right now, but that's what this import is for. And I'm gonna tell it to clear the configuration when it does the import. So I'm clicking that box. 
and there we go. We have the original drive, that is the boot drive, the uh, 16 gigabyte, and I have three 32 gig hard drives, which I can then format, join together, whatever I want to do. So I'm going to apply these changes, sigma as command. Let me go into format, HDD format. I'm going to format those three. I click on those three. I'm going to make it ZFS text. And now I got all three of those checked. I format them. And then I'll stop at this point because, um, you know, this is just a regular, at this point, Sigma NAS install. I'll probably be going using this, this method for doing the next phase of my server build. I'm going to do basically a dry run, making sure that the configuration I do for Samba works properly here. I'm all done. So at this point, I have all of my disk formatted. They're in ZFS mode, and I can actually go ahead and turn this into a NAS if I wanted to. Okay, well, that completes this video on VirtualBox. Hopefully, you got something out of it. Anyway, there may be a third video to this. It depends on demand. If people put some comments and they'd like to see some more advanced features, which I've mentioned along the way a little bit, some of the stuff that I skipped in this one, which are of a significantly more advanced nature, then just let me know. I get enough people asking about it. I'll make a third one, which will be an advanced video on VirtualBox. But hopefully you got something out of this video. And if you did, please do me a favor and subscribe to my channel. My head will pop up here in a moment. Click on it, follow along, and subscribe. That would really help the channel grow. Well, thanks, and until next time, take care.